Hello and welcome to The Take with Sophie Ridge, live at nine, right here in the heart of Westminster. Tonight, a shock resignation. The Prime Minister's own ethics advisor, Lord Gite, has stepped down, saying it was the right thing to do. It's apparently taken Number 10 completely by surprise, although just yesterday, Lord Gite appeared in front of a parliamentary committee, admitting his frustrations over how Partygate was handled. What next for the Prime Minister? We'll bring you takes from all sides over the next 60 minutes. Of course, you know, resignation is, is one of the rather blunt but uh, few tools available to uh, an independent uh, advisor. Um... Well, he, of course, has now decided to use that blunt tool of resignation, a Downing Street source describing it as a complete surprise to the Prime Minister. And, of course, uh, the government was hoping uh, to move on from Partygate. In the House of Commons today, the Home Secretary, Priti Patel, was pushing the controversial policy to send asylum seekers to Rwanda. The humane, decent and moral response to all of this is simply not to stand by and let people down or to be sold into slavery or to be smuggled, but to stop this. And with that, Madam Deputy... And it was an unusually colourful Prime Minister's questions from the Labour leader Keir Starmer after his own MPs briefed the papers that he was being a bit too boring. As for his boasting about the economy, he, he thinks he can perform Jedi mind tricks on the country. <laughs> These aren't the droids you're looking for. No rules were broken. The economy is booming. The problem is, the force just isn't with him anymore. He, th he thinks he's Obi-Wan Kenobi. The truth is, he's Jabba the Hutt. Well, the jury's out on the jokes, uh, but certainly not a boring performance there from uh, Keir Starmer. We're also, of course, going to be taking the temperature uh, with the most important people, our panellists, our viewers' panel. We're going to be asking them about what they make of the Lord Guy resignation. Do they care? Here they all are. Thank you so much for being here. Give us a little wave. Looking forward to getting your opinions later on uh, in the programme. We'll also have some top guests on the show, including the Home Office Minister, Tom Persglove, We'll also be talking to Labour's shadow Scottish Secretary in Murray and the Rotherham MP at Sarah Champion. And much more besides two, all coming up on The Take. Hello, good evening. Well, Westminster is still reeling from the sudden resignation of Lord Gite, the Prime Minister's ethics advisor, who quit after months of criticism over Partygate and questions over breaches of the ministerial code. It's not the only front the government is battling on with fights over Brexit, immigration and rail strikes, although you do get the sense the Prime Minister may be more comfortable fighting some of those battles than others. So let's crack straight on. We're going to start with the best bits of the week so far. The government insists that its plans for new legislation to override parts of the Northern Ireland Protocol will not break international law. We're very clear that we're acting in line with the law. Now, of course, we remain open to negotiations with the EU. I believe that, uh, finally, we are now seeing the kind of uh, action that is required uh, to begin the process of removing the barriers to trade within the United Kingdom. The British government uh, pulled back from negotiations as far back as February in this year and they haven't engaged in good faith uh, since that time and actually the whole way through this whole Brexit mess they have reneged on political commitments and I think that that makes them a very uh, bad faith partner. We believe at this stage is seven people who have been earmarked for this flight to Rwanda. There are a number of appeals going through the High Court at the moment. If those fail then they will be put on that plane. We are not going to be in any way uh, deterred or abashed by some of the criticism that is being directed upon this policy. We are going to get on and, and deliver. If they're not on this flight, they will be on the next flight. We want to break the model. Let's bring you some breaking news in the past few minutes. Sky News understands that the plane, which we'd uh, talked so much about at the start of the programme, due to transport asylum seekers to Rwanda, will not leave this evening. It has saddened me, Madam Deputy Speaker, to see Rwanda so terribly misrepresented yeah. and traduced yeah. in recent weeks. It is another example of how, all too often, critics not only don't know what they're speaking about, but seek to vilify another international country. It is not, and never has been, a serious policy, and she knew that when she chartered the plane. 
She knew that among the people she was planning to send to Rwanda on this plane were torture and trafficking victims. I mean, these discussions uh, were uh, underway when suddenly the, the, the union decided it would ballot its member, telling them incorrectly that it was to get them off a pay freeze. These are entirely pointless, counterproductive strikes. They should never have been called, and the party opposite should recognise that fact. Breaking news in the last few minutes. The Boris Johnson's adviser on ministerial interests has resigned. There you go, another pretty busy day uh, in Westminster. And our government guest today, of course, uh, thought he was coming on the programme to talk uh, about the government's uh, asylum seekers policy. I promise I will get to that, of course. Um, but really, this evening uh, is dominated by that resignation of uh, Lord uh, Guyte. We're joined now uh, by the Home Office Minister, Tom Purdsglove, to see if you can shed any light uh, on what happened. Um, do we know why Lord Guyte has decided to step down? Well, Sophie, I've been, I have to say, touring the television studios this evening talking about the latest developments with regard to Rwanda. So I haven't seen a huge amount on this. But, of course, Lord Guy has a distinguished career in public service in a number of roles. I think we're surprised as a government that he's taken the decision that he has. And, of course, it'll be for him to set out in more detail the reasons for why he's reached the conclusion to resign that he has. But I'm, I'm sorry to see him go and, um, and thank him for his service. Um, you know, you were saying about how we're, we're, it's a surprise for Number 10, that that's what we've been briefed as well, uh, this resignation. But at the same time, you know, he did go in front of this committee, uh, didn't he, uh, saying that there was... Um, he was frustrated with some of the responses to Partygate. He's previously said that there was legitimate questions over whether the Prime Minister uh, broke um, the ministerial code after receiving this fine over Partygate. It feels like he felt his position was untenable defending the Prime Minister, doesn't it? I think Lord Guy would need to speak... For himself, obviously, it has been an eventful few weeks that we've seen. I think the Prime Minister has been very clear consistently that in terms of what happened with regard to gatherings in Number 10, he's apologised unreservedly for that. I think we now need to move forward and get on with the job of governing. Certainly in my own constituency, but also when I go around the country and campaigning in the by-election, for example, I've heard a lot of people saying that they just want government to get on with the job of governing. They want the opposition to talk about the issues that matter as well. I think that's where our focus should now be. But it's right that Lord Guy sets those matters out in his own terms, in his own way, in a way of his choosing. Uh, at the same time, though, it does feel as though perhaps Lord Guy had reached the end of his tether defending Boris Johnson. They've had run-ins before, uh, haven't they, uh, over uh, the refurbishment of the Downing Street flat when the Prime Minister failed to disclose uh, messages uh, between himself and a Conservative peer who uh, paid for the reno re renovations. Lord Guyte said that demonstrated insufficient respect for his role. The frustrations with Boris Johnson had been well documented. I think that Lord Guyte has been very professional in his dealings and the work that he's done and he's obviously reached a conclusion that he wishes to resign and that's what he's done and it'll be for him to set out the reasons why if that's what he wishes to do. Um, I, look, I, I completely understand that um, you can't put words in his mouth. We haven't really got a statement yet from uh, Lord Guy explaining those reasons and so I appreciate the position you're in. At the same time though, Lord Guy is the second person to have resigned from this job under Boris Johnson's premiership. I mean, he's only been Prime Minister for three years. Sir Alex Allen quit in 2020 after Mr Johnson refused to accept his finding that Home Secretary Priti Patel had bullied civil servants. It doesn't look good, does it, to lose not one but two ethics advisers? Again, I'm not going to get drawn on this. I've not had much opportunity to familiarise myself with well, we what know, we know has that, happened. We know I that also, two people have resigned from this. Frankly, part. I haven't got a sort of in-depth knowledge of previous holders of the role and for how long they've held the position for. Um, you know, clearly there are term lengths sometimes involved in public appointments and people decide to serve for a particular length of time. There may be personal reasons that he's decided not to continue. I, I don't know and it would be wrong for me to speculate. Um, finally, some, some people might be looking at this thinking... It shouldn't be Lord Guyot resigning over this, it should be Boris Johnson. He's been fired from pol by the police for breaking the rules. Uh, 148 of his own MPs uh, have said that they've got no confidence uh, in him. Uh, and he's now lost two ethics advisers. I don't think the Prime Minister should resign. He was given an overwhelming mandate in that 2019 general election. He delivered Brexit, he's got us through the pandemic. The vaccination rollout was a huge success and the government played a part in delivering that. We're now emerging from COVID-19. We're dealing with the situation in Ukraine. We've got the cost of living challenges. And I work with him on the illegal migration issue week in, week out. And I know how determined he is to get to grips with that. I think that for the Prime Minister, there is still a lot more to give. Um, he is committed to getting on with the day job, delivering on the promises that we made. And I know that's what he's determined to do. Uh, even if 
I will move on to Rwanda, but e even if you lose both of the by-elections coming up in Wakefield and Tiverton, he's the man for the job. By-elections are unpredictable. I mean, I obviously represent the Corby constituency. We had a by-election in 2012. Labour took the seat off us. I got the seat back two and a half years later, having worked tirelessly for two years campaigning, and it just shows the unpredictability that there is. And uh, we've got two good, very good candidates who are working hard. I hope that they're going to be able to convince people in those communities to vote for them and vote Conservative. I'm backing them, and I'll be working to, to support them over the coming days to do just that. OK, let's talk Rwanda. Um, Pretty Patel, of course, making it pretty clear she wants to push ahead uh, with the policy of sending asylum seekers uh, to uh, Rwanda uh, after it was blocked uh, in the courts. When do you hope the first plane to take off? Well, I can't comment on those operational specifics of when that plane might take off, but we are talking about a matter of weeks. Um, we've been consistently clear that we need to deliver on this policy objective. We can't continue to have people making perilous journeys across the channel, facilitated by evil criminal gangs, undercutting, of course, people coming via safe and legal means. Let's come in and, there. And, and what what are to... the safe and legal means? If you're not from Ukraine or Afghanistan, where there are clear uh, routes to the UK, how do you claim asylum? Because if you look at the government's advice, um, you know, that it says that you should apply for asylum when you arrive in the UK, but it also says your claim effectively won't be considered if you've travelled to the UK through a safe third country. I mean, it's basically impossible to claim asylum legally, isn't it? Well, the point is that what we do is we respond to global crises as they emerge, and we have bespoke schemes that are in place to provide the support that we want to give, and I think we have a proud tradition... So, if you're, not from, so if you're not from Ukraine and you're not from Afghanistan, what is the safe and legal route for you to claim asylum in the UK? Well, there's further examples. Look at, for example, the response to the Hong Kong BNO situation. Look at the response to the how Syria say, crisis where we accommodated people. How can you say that it's going to be a deterrent people? for the people in France currently when there isn't a, another rate for them to claim asylum. All of those people, Sophie, are leaving what are fundamentally safe countries to make perilous journeys. The idea that so France no, is not no a safe country... Well, one of the asylum. things we do do, for example, is we work with the UNHCR in refugee camps in areas around the world to provide resettlement opportunities for people. Obviously, the UNHCR do have a lot of experience in, in handling those cases, in identifying particular vulnerabilities where we can make the biggest impact in terms of our help. I think that's the right approach, so that in response to individual crises, we make the best possible schemes that are as generous as possible. We've seen that in response to Ukraine in recent weeks and the generosity of the British people. But I also think if we can help the most vulnerable people on the face of the planet, that's precisely what we should do. I just want to read the UK government's current travel advice to Rwanda. Uh, it says homosexuality isn't illegal in Rwanda, but it remains frowned on by many. LGBT individuals can experience discrimination and abuse, including from local authorities. There are no specific anti-discrimination laws that protect LGBT individuals. Are you comfortable at sending people to a country where, according to your own advice, they can experience discrimination and abuse, including from local authorities? Well, actually, there's a fundamental principle that cuts through the um, Rwandan constitution that deals with anti-discrimination. And you mentioned the travel advice from the FCDO, but we've also had conducted a comprehensive country report on Rwanda that deals with all of these matters. That work is carried out by a reputable team that actually the courts have regularly commended the quality of the work that is done as being authoritative in terms of those country-by-country -country reports. And it's also just worth pointing out that the UNHCR place people in Rwanda for the purposes of providing sanctuary, which I think gives quite a strong indication about how they feel about people being safe. In fact, there's representatives of the UNHCR who are on the record saying Rwanda is a safe environment for refugees. But of course, in the end, the fundamental principle that we work through in this policy is that people will only be relocated if it is safe and appropriate for them. It's right that we take case-by-case -case decisions, taking proper account of people's circumstances. Uh, just finally, there's been some frustration from some of your colleagues about the ruling uh, by the European Court of Human Rights. Do you think it's time to look at um, pulling out? So the Prime Minister said that we will rule nothing out and that we're going to have to look at this because we've got to deliver on this policy. We've made a commitment. We're determined to deliver on this. And I would argue that there's lives at stake if we don't follow through. So, so does that mean you are, you're, you're leaving the but, door open? But, to it? but the difficulty we've got at the moment is obviously the European Court of Human Rights has handed down a ruling, but we haven't been even provided with the detail of that ruling and the underpinning rationale behind well, all it. It's, all it's so when I left the office they, earlier, all it's saying, my understanding is that you should just wait until the the actual judgment, which is in what July. I don't think it's unreasonable for us as ministers to want to see 
all of that information properly presented and in full so that we can make judgments about what is appropriate in terms of next steps. But the Prime Minister said that we don't rule out having to change our domestic law, for example, if that's what's necessary in order to facilitate this. The thing is, if we don't, we'll just continue to have these criminal gangs exploiting people, taking their money, all the risk to life. We'd lost 27 lives in the Channel in November, 39 people in the back of a lorry in Greys in Essex a few years ago. That is what keeps me awake at night, frankly, as the illegal migration minister. We've got to get to grips with it. Failure is simply not an option. OK, thank you very much for being on the programme, uh, Tom Perslove. Uh, there, uh, talking uh, about the Rwanda policy, but also, of course, uh, that resignation by uh, Lord Guy. Not much light shed uh, on the reasons behind uh, that resignation. Let's see if we can get a bit more detail now with our deputy political editor, uh, Sam Coates. What do you make of it all? Do we have any guidance on what happened and why? Well, it was interesting hearing Minister Tom Perseglove say that really it's for Lord Guy to set out his reasons. That's true up to a point, Lord Copper, because, of course, Number 10 do know exactly why Lord Gite says he resigned, because Lord Gite has written them a letter. And at some point, Boris Johnson may respond in writing, but at the moment, I understand that there are no plans by Number 10 to release the letter from Lord Gite, which sets out the reasoning. Uh, for public consumption, instead, uh, Lord Gite issued a rather convoluted couple of sentences statement, uh, basically saying that he agreed with his own decision to resign. Now, He's what does that... He's quite guy, isn't he? I have to say, sometimes I'm picking uh, the, the, the crux of his arguments. It takes a bit of time, doesn't it, Sam? You're incredibly polite, Sophie. <laughs> it, 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 uh, it doesn't make much sense. He's more than elliptical quite a lot of the time. But, but what I would say about making a statement like that and leaving it there and not setting out on the record on his own website what he thinks is this isn't exactly the start of a sort of coup attempt. This wasn't... Uh, if he doesn't set out the reasons in public, if he doesn't make clear his complaints about Boris Johnson's behaviour, then he's leaving it for us to infer, but he's also not giving perhaps those opponents to Boris Johnson uh, very much to go with, a stick to sort of beat the Prime Minister with, all after Boris Johnson has won that vote of no confidence. Yes, 140 Tory, uh, 48 Tory MPs voted against him. His position remains uncertain. But tonight would really matter if Lord Guite had issued a stinging statement setting out the ethical failures, playing into the hands uh, of the rebels. Instead, an elliptical statement issued at half past six, allowing us only to guess what's behind this, uh, doesn't feel like it's the thing that's about to trigger something big. Uh, interesting stuff. And as you say, uh, even though it feels like we can uh, suppose, we can make some good assumptions about why he resigned, we don't have his words. And so it is uh, speculation, uh, really, at the minute. Um, Sam, thank you very much for your analysis. We'll have more from Sam later in the programme. Well, let's get the reaction now from the uh, Labour Party. We can speak to the Shadow Scottish Secretary in Murray. Thank you very much for being uh, with us. Well, let's talk about this mm -hmm. resignation. What, what is your reaction? Oh, well, we're not shocked because this is the second ethics advisor that this Prime Minister's have. Don't forget that Sir uh, Alexander Allen, who was the previous ethics advisor, resigned two years ago because he wrote a report into the current Home Secretary bullying staff uh, and the Prime Minister backed Priti Patel and therefore he resigned. So Lord Guy came into the role from then. Um, and although his statement tonight doesn't really say very much, he has in the last few weeks said that the Prime Minister has ridiculed uh, the ethical code, the ministerial code. He's said that he's been skirting around the edges of the ministerial code and I think his ethics advisor has just had enough. Is he so ridicule of the ministerial code? Why do you say that? That, that was a, f a few weeks ago when he had produced the report in terms of the Prime Minister's uh, uh, attitude to the ministerial code, when he said that he should have been explaining all the way through Partygate... It's not necessarily he was saying ridiculed, is it? Uh, he said code. that he should uh, explain why he didn't believe he broke the ministerial and code. And he used the word ridicule, the, the ministerial code. So it's little wonder that Lord Guy has had to resign because it's quite clear uh, that the Prime Minister has broken the ministerial code. He will now go to the Privileges Committee um, and, you know, the history is there for people to see that what he's been saying in Parliament and what's been happening in, in Downing Street. And, you know, the Prime Minister will now no longer tr get an ethical advisor. I mean, who would want to do that job? It'd be trying to find, similar to trying in Hannibal Lecter, a dentist, I would imagine, in terms of what the job would entail now for someone who wants to try and keep this Prime Minister ethical. I mean, it's difficult, though, isn't it? Because we, we don't know why he resigned. Yes, we can obviously make the, the suppositions. We know, of course, he is in front of the Parliamentary Committee. Uh, we know, of course, that he has expressed frustration about how the Prime Minister dealt with Partygate. But it's not a smoking gun unless he tells us why he resigned, is it? Well, and he may tell us why he's resigned, but the word ethics and this Prime Minister don't really go very comfortably together. And if you're the Prime Minister's ethics advisor and trying to advise on him sticking to the ministerial code, he's been fined by the police, 
He's been shown to at least have lied in Parliament, whether that be intentional or not, and the Privileges Committee will look at that. So the job that he's been asked to do is almost an impossible job, and he's decided, obviously, to leave his role. And I hope in the next few days he does uh, what public service should do and what's in the public interest and tells us exactly uh, why he's resigned and, and the, the details of the information that the Prime Minister uh, has got in terms of his so resignation. So you think, as a public servant, he should explain the, the reasons for I, I think it's in the public interest to do so. This is the second ethics advisor to resign with this Prime Minister because the Prime Minister hasn't been listening to the advice that they had employed it to give him. He's already said a few weeks ago that he thinks that the Prime Minister should have been explaining why he was sticking to the ministerial code or not in terms of Partygate and he hasn't done that. He's used the word ridiculing the ministerial code and today he's decided to, to resign and I think the public will look on this and realise that the Prime Minister has now lost two ethics advisors in the last two years and that really is quite unacceptable in the current environment. Okay. Um, we've been been talking a bit about Rwanda uh, today, keen to get your uh, opinion on that. Would a Labour government cancel the agreement with Rwanda and stop sending asylum seekers there? Well, of course, because we wouldn't have it in the first place. You know, it's quite clear that this is unworkable, it's unethical, it's costly Just, and it's indeed illegal. So would you cancel it then? Uh, we would, yes. I mean, that's it's pretty clear. I think Yvette Cooper, the Shadow Home Secretary, was clear about that in the chamber today. She completely tore this policy apart. And let's be quite clear about what this policy is doing. It's taking asylum seekers who are crossing the channel dangerously in dinghies, sticking them on planes to Rwanda, and if their asylum uh, uh, application is successful under the rules of the UK's asylum processes, they stay in Rwanda. That's unethical and it's unworkable and it's hugely expensive. And it's, it's interesting that, I don't know if Tom said that in his interview with you a few minutes ago, but I don't know if he told you how much this was going to cost, because the Home Secretary refuses to tell us. So it's quite clear that this is a policy that's just about extending the culture wars. It does nothing to stop people crossing... So them. what is your strategy then? to Because this is what the government says. It says, look, we had 440 uh, people trying to make that crossing yesterday. It's incredibly dangerous. There's got to be something to stop it. What's your strategy? Uh, well, what the current government are trying to do... No, what, what's your strategy? The, well, this is what I'm, I'm going to tell. What the current government are trying to do is to take the people off those boats and send them to Rwanda. What they really need to be trying doing is have a relationship with the French and the Belgians to be able to try and stop these crossings from happening. Go so after the criminal gangs. But, but, so, so, You've got to go after the criminal gangs. Not taking, years, happened, not taking it's, people it's, it's out of dinghies easy. and sending them to Rwanda. Now, you said there was 444 yesterday. That's with the Rwanda policy, so it's quite clearly not going to work, and it's unethical and it's completely and utterly unworkable, and of course it is now deemed to be illegal as well, so we need those um, okay. criminal gangs taken out. Now, it's really strange that the Home Secretary spent all of her time creating a relationship with a country like Rwanda, and none of her time talking to the French, or indeed the Belgians in terms of this issue. We need to go after those criminal gangs to stop those boats coming across, and maybe we need another Dublin arrangement which we need to work on so that asylum seekers can be dealt with in the country they first arrive. Uh, OK, let's uh, just finally, uh, I want to talk to you a little bit uh, with your uh, Scotland hat on because uh, Nicola Sturgeon yesterday was vowing to push ahead with the idea of a second independence uh, referendum. Now, if you look at the current polling, local elections, the current polling, everything is pointing towards a hung parliament uh, in Westminster. Uh, it would be a lot easier for Labour, of course, to form a government in that case uh, rather than the Conservatives. Would you be prepared to do a deal with the SNP? No. Uh, no. There'll be no deals into the election, there'll be no deals coming out of the election. And our challenge to the SNP, if Labour formed the administration as the largest party, would be do what you did in 1979 if you wish to bring in another Conservative government or back the Labour administration. That would be well, the that way is we a would deal, do then, it. isn't it? Saying that you'd back the Labour administration, that's a Well, they would have to decide vote by vote if they wanted to either vote with us or vote with the Conservatives. That's not a supply arrangement. There's no arrangement okay. whatsoever. As Keir has been clear time and time again, and as Sarber has been clear and will continue to be clear, no deals going into the election, none coming out because we don't require. Even them. if it lets the Conservatives into power. It won't let the Conservatives into power if we're the largest party because the SNP would have to largest. decide. <laughs> the SNP would have to decide to vote with the Conservatives to bring it down a Labour government. I'm not sure they would do that. I don't think it's in their political interest to do that. And if they, like us, share the view that we want to get rid of this Conservative government, then the people of Scotland, when they're voting the next general election, can do that by voting Labour. OK, Ian Murray, thank you very much for being uh, on the programme uh, this evening. Busy start uh, to the take. We are live here in Westminster. Up next, we're going to be talking to our panel about the resignation of Lord Guite, trying to find out what they made of today's Prime Minister's questions.
Hello, welcome back to The Take. Now, the political highlight of midweek, well, at least for political geeks like me, is Prime Minister's questions, when the Prime Minister faces party leaders and backbenchers from all sides. Now, this week, after being told to put a bit more welly in from his deputy, Angela Rayner, Sir Keir Starmer compared Boris Johnson to a contestant on Love Island who was giving the public the ick. Here's what our political correspondent, Ali Fortescue, made of it all. This is PMQ's Unwrapped. It was a particularly rowdy Prime Minister's questions. Last week, Keir Starmer was accused of being lacklustre, heavy on the detail, lacking in punch. This week, he focused on the economy with some colourful metaphors. The force just isn't with him anymore. Yeah. He, th yeah. he thinks he's Obi-Wan Kenobi. Yeah. The truth is he's Jabba the Hutt. Yeah. He thinks he's on Love Island. <laughs> Trouble is... Prime Minister, I'm reliably informed that contestants that give the public the ick get booted out. Yeah. When did screwing business turn from a flippant comment into economic policy? Yeah. And his questions were much shorter and snappier than last week. Britain is set for lower growth than every major economy except Russia. Why? The Labour leader decided to push on the economy. Our analysis of his language shows he focused on words like inflation, growth, business. The Prime Minister wanted to talk about jobs, using words like investment and employment. One thing Boris Johnson definitely wanted to talk about was Labour's position on rail strikes. What would be useful in supporting the UK economy right now would be if, he, if the leader of the Labour Party ended his sphinx-like silence about the RMT strikes coming up in the course of the next couple of weeks. Uh, will, he, will, he now, uh, will he now break with his shadow transport secretary and denounce Labour's rail strikes? The PM even prompting a telling off from the Speaker by turning the questions onto the Labour leader. Just to remind the Prime Minister, he seems to have gone, his Prime Minister's questions, the opposition <laughs> question. Keir Starmer, I don't want the strikes to go ahead, but he does! Elsewhere, the Lib Dem leader, Ed Davey, was keen to talk about fuel prices in places like Devon, a week before a by-election in Devon. The Rural Fuel Duty Relief Scheme is supposed to help by taking money off the price of petrol. But some rural counties aren't eligible. Like Cumbria, like Shropshire, and like Devon. A coincidence not lost on the Tory benches. But PMQs was just as interesting for what Keir Starmer didn't ask the Prime Minister. There were no questions on the big divisive issues of the day, like the Northern Ireland Protocol and the government's Rwanda plan, thorny issues around Brexit and immigration. Labour wanted to avoid. Uh, there you go, getting the ick. Who would have thought that would be uh, a word that you'd be hearing in the House of Commons today? I'm not sure it was on my uh, PMQ's bingo card anyway. Well, that was the Commons uh, this afternoon. Let's have a little chat now uh, to what people watching on Sky News uh, made of all the politics uh, today. We're joined now by our viewers panel. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, this is something we do every week. We try and balance it uh, politically, geographically, just to try and take the temperature from our own viewers about some of the hot political issues of the day. Now, I thought it was going to be Rwanda, but I really do want to talk to you about the resignation that we've seen this evening again, of course, uh, Lord Geit. Uh, let's talk to Rob Tyler first, uh, shall we? Now, uh, Rob Tyler, he's a familiar face uh, if you've uh, been watching the take uh, in recent uh, weeks. Conservative voter. Uh, Rob, talk to me about Lord Geit. Right. Are you bothered? Uh, do you think it's a bad look for the Prime Minister? Do you think we should all move on? What is your take? Well, I think um, uh, Lord Geit has been a, a value member of the government team and I'm sure that uh, his advice and his uh, intelligence have been missed. But I think like any advisor, if, if your advice isn't being taken, then eventually you're going to take your ball and go home. Uh, there you go, uh, Rob, a uh, uh, view uh, on that. Uh, Rob, just quickly on Rwanda, I'm interested to get your view uh, on that as a Conservative uh, voter as well. Because uh, we've heard a lot, you know, of, of you know, people, particularly on the left, I guess, uh, who are really unhappy with this policy, they think it's inhumane. Uh, are you someone who is supportive of it? I think it's difficult to, to come out as a supporter with a, a knee-jerk reaction from others, uh, thinking that you may be a racist or or some such, but I do feel that it has been important to take back um, our, our own borders. And we have to do something. We can't allow 
undocumented people unchecked into the country. Um, for their sakes, we need to uh, to ensure that they're safe coming over, and that when they do get here, that they realise that the, the pavements aren't uh, the streets aren't paved with gold. It's not Dick Whittington, and that they could come unstuck and end up in a in a very very bad situation. We need their own safety as well to be thought about. Um, moving people to Rwanda um, could be um, a little bit a bit far, but but if you took them back to France, they'll be back over next week. So there has to be there has to be somewhere to put them. Okay, uh, interesting stuff. Thank you for sharing your view uh, with us uh, this evening, uh, Rob. Right, let's bring in Ros now, uh, shall we? Ros, uh, you're definitely someone who's had some strong views on Boris Johnson in recent weeks. Uh, Labour voter uh, from York. Um, what did you make of uh, the Lord Guy res resignation? Well, I think he's very sensibly realised that um, he's unable to do the job and he's just been given the runaround um, by Boris Johnson. People who are associated with Boris Johnson are getting themselves in, in, a, in a bad, bad situation. He can't do the job. Boris Johnson is a serial liar, is behaving unethically. The last thing I'd want on my CV is having been his ethics advisor. And I think that's, you know, that, that has dawned on Lord Guite. And that seems to be very clearly what's going on. He's divorcing himself from it because he's unable to do the job. Uh, Ros, very quickly, what did you make of Keir Starmer at PMQs? Dad jokes or was it really funny? What, what did you think? I thought one or two of them landed. I mean, I thought the idea of Boris Johnson trying Jedi mind tricks, just repeating the same things often enough and hoping people <laughs> are going to believe it. I mean, I think that that, that smacked of, of the truth. I think Keir Starmer's got a really difficult job, actually, because how do you continually ask questions of somebody who doesn't answer them and who blusters and lies? So you've got a grown-up asking questions of somebody who is behaving, well, it's more like a cartoon character these days, isn't it? He's becoming almost a caricature of himself. Um, it, it, it's desperately sad to see our country has come to this, that, that this person is the Prime Minister. It's, it, it's quite unbelievable, and, and it really does look like we have a grown-up asking questions of a, well, it's like a toddler having a tantrum. The man's deluded. Uh, there you go. Strong uh, views, as always, uh, from you, uh, Ros. We can always rely on you uh, to uh, <laughs> make your views about Boris Johnson very well known. Uh, let's talk to uh, Pradeep now, uh, Pradeep Sekatharan, who is a Labour voter. Um, I'm really interested to talk to you a little bit about the Rwanda uh, policy, because I know that you were speaking to my producer a little bit earlier, um, saying that you have a family story, you're a war refugee, yourself, that you came to the UK when you were six from Sri Lanka. So I'm just interested in your perspective on, on this policy. Yeah, um, quite frankly, I'm lucky that my parents took the risk to come to this country, a country I love, and I've lived the British dream, I truly have. Um, having said that, it doesn't mean that uh, I'm for allowing everyone into the country. I think this policy is ill thought of um, and poor in execution. I do believe there's more we should be doing in early routes in terms of looking at investments and how we actually nip the bud. Uh, can we go back to the countries where these individuals are originating from and give them more legal options to apply to come to this country? Uh, are we looking far beyond France and Belgium and working with international partners to stop criminal gangs? Because, Sophie, to be frank, somewhere in the world now, a family is taking a risk to come to this country because of the British dream and they will not stop. A, because they probably don't know about the Rwanda uh, deterrent. Uh, B, uh, they frankly don't care. So they will always take the risk. And even if you stop certain business models and certain criminals, there'll be more criminals to take their place. So we need very thought out investments in countries where these uh, people are originating from and stopping the criminal uh, networks in other countries such as North Africa, Turkey and other routes and not just closer to home. Really interesting to get your uh, perspective. Another person's perspective that I'm keen to get on Rwanda is Stella. Stella Finley, you're a Green voter or maybe a Lib Dem voter, not a Conservative supporter. But I'm interested in your perspective on Rwanda because you say that you know people who, who've lived in Rwanda. What, what's your take on this policy? Uh, yes, I, I knew a couple of people who'd worked in Rwanda for a number of years and um, they loved the country. And um, this was before the Hutu uprising. Um, 
but the Tutsis are now in power again. And I think that Rwanda has been misrepresented because it's a beautiful country. People actually go there on holiday. So I don't think it's such a dreadful destination for these people. Um, they are going to be well looked after. Um, it's reputed to be one of the safest countries in Africa. So I don't think they are at risk. And I don't, I think they will be looked after because I think that money is obviously following these people to Rwanda. And so um, the government there wants the money and they just wouldn't allow anything to go wrong with it. Mm, interesting stuff. It does feel like we're getting a bit of splits of opinion. I can see some shaking heads uh, in the answer as well. Just quickly, can we do a bit of a show of hands? If you're in favour of the Rwanda policy, and I know it's a bit com more complicated than that, but if you're in favour of the Rwanda policy generally, can you put your hand up overall? And if you're not in favour, put your hand up now. So, yeah, majority more against the policy than for, but there is a bit of a difference of opinion. So, yeah, really interesting to talk to everyone about that. And I know it is quite sensitive talking about these uh, issues, so we do appreciate it. Uh, right, let's go back to Lord Guide, shall we? Uh, Belinda Campbell, um, you're a swing voter. So, you know, always swing voters are always quite fascinating to see how, how these issues land. Um, are you troubled by the resignation of Lord Guide? I think it's an opportunity for somebody to make a statement at that time. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of unspoken. Well, it's not unspoken, but it, because he hasn't gone into details, it is making a statement. And to say that it's the right thing to do could be so many reasons. So it, it does carry weight until we have more information. And um, yeah, I think it's, uh, I'm looking forward to hearing what, what, what the real reason was or there's maybe more than one reason. Has Partygate changed your opinion of the Prime Minister? Yes, I think if you are responsible for a country, running a country, and you're held in that position, you should behave in a way that's um, respectable and, um, you know, have a, make a good example of yourself. So it doesn't give it doesn't make a good example if you're breaking laws and, and speaking on television telling everybody to do one thing and then doing another okay and then just finally let's end with chloe shall we chloe forrest conservative voter you live in uh, cumbria chloe don't you um lord guite uh, party gate um how uh, much weight do you do you place on the fact that lord guite has felt that his position is untenable or do you think it's time that we moved on um, I think, firstly, I think it's really, really concerning, to be honest, that he's had two ethics advisors that have, have now resigned while he's been in power. I think, um, as Ros said just before, I think, is it something you would want, you know, to be named as during this period when he's been breaking rules, you know, on your CV? So I think he probably has done the right thing. I probably would have done the same. And I've sat here week in, week out, and I have fought Boris's corner quite a bit. However, sometimes it's made quite difficult. I'm interested to hear you say that, Chloe, because you're right. You have been on a lot of shows, and often in the minority, you've said, look, let's cut Boris Johnson a bit of slack, even though you're you know, a nurse, you kind of work throughout the pandemic, so you do know more than most of us uh, about uh, you know, the rules and the impact of that. Are you reaching the end of your tether a little bit with it? Is that right? Is that, or am I going too far? Yeah, no, I think there is, a, there is quite a few things. I think, I think I do see the good in the things that he's doing. I think he's had a really tough run as well. I think, you know, he started off, he came into power, he had to deal with Brexit, he had to deal with the pandemic, he's got the war in Ukraine. You know, so many things have been kind of thrown at him. However, he has made mistakes. I think some of them we should kind of move on from, but it's getting to the point almost now, how many how many mistakes can he make before people do lose patience a little bit with that? Because um, as much as I do think he's done good, I think, yeah, it's, it's just hard to defend him a little bit now. And certain things that he comes out with, like I've just seen something earlier that I got sent and I, I just think it's not, he's not prioritising very well. He's not you know, putting things in the order they should be putting is, is concentrating on things that are sometimes unimportant. You know, we've got people that can't afford to feed the kids that go to work every day and he wants to carry on, you know, flights from Blackpool Airport. 
but that's no good when people can't afford to feed the kids. They can't afford to go on flights from Blackpool Airport. It's just managing those priorities, isn't it? And he's not seeming to do that very well. Really interesting. Uh, we are out of time. Uh, thank you very much for a wide range of views. I did pepper you with topics a bit, so I appreciate um, everyone being up for uh, giving us your view on a, on a variety, so much appreciated. You're watching The Take. We are live uh, in Westminster. Up next, we'll hear our question of the week, where we give a backbencher a chance to respond to the Prime Minister. Hello, welcome back. Now it's our regular chance to speak to a backbencher as we pick our PMQ of the week. It's the one that really caught our eye during the session earlier. And today it's on a really important topic. It is this one. Mental health support is vital for victims of sexual crimes. When a Rotherham survivor, who's here today, reported her childhood abuse to the police, they told her not to go for counselling as it could be used against her in court. Yes. Your Attorney General is challenging the rules, so it's even easier for defence teams to access victims' counselling notes, mm -hmm. having mm -hmm. an immediate chilling effect. Yes. Survivors yes. shouldn't be forced to choose between their mental health and justice. Mm. Yeah. Prime yeah. Minister, please stop this. Yes. Uh, Sarah Champion there, the MP for Rotherham. Now, of course, usually the questioner doesn't get a chance to respond uh, to the Prime Minister's answer to their question. The idea of this is we'll try and put that right and each week let an MP do that. So let's talk now to Sarah Champion, Labour MP for Rotherham. She joins us now. What did you make of the Prime Minister's response to your question? Um, well, the best I can say is it was respectful. Uh, so I appreciate that, not least because the constituent that I've been campaigning with this on for the last 18 months was, was physically there in the chamber. So that was a blessing. Unfortunately, the answer that he gave was that, you know, he was all over this and, of course, he was putting victims first. But the reality is that prosecutions for rape crimes, um, my constituent was a child abuse crime, are down to an all-time low. They've, they've actually plummeted from 1.6% of those being prosecuted, well, the crimes being reported to them being prosecuted and then going to jail. Um, and it's even lower now, it's now dropped to 1.3%, which is ridiculous. Um, and what I've been asking for relentlessly is for victims and survivors just to have a bit of support. So my constituent was told by the police that she couldn't get counselling support, it would be used against her. So for 18 months of going through a really harrowing trial, she had to do that on her own. Her family had stepped away from her largely at that point and she had she had no counselling. Um, it left her deeply traumatised to the extent that she actually left the country and has only recently come back. Be interesting. I was, uh, I was really keen, to be honest, to talk to you uh, this evening because you know, your question struck a bit of a nerve with me because I did an interview with a rape survivor uh, about a year ago, it would have been, and she talked a lot about the process that she went through, her phone being confiscated by police. She received the same advice that any therapy that she received could be accessed uh, by the trial uh, and effectively used against to those notes. And it really left a bit of an impression on me. Um, it was, I was, I guess I was quite shocked, to be honest, uh, at what some people have to go through uh, to get justice. How do you think we treat victims of sexual crime in this country? Um, I mean, I, I know too much about this and I have spoken to victims and survivors from all over the country. This isn't isolated. I, I liken it to if my car was stolen and I went into the police station and reported it, then they would automatically believe me until the evidence was pointed, you know, that I was making it up. If you report a sexual crime in this country, whether it's, it's rape, whether it's sexual violence, domestic abuse, child abuse, the immediate assumption is that you, the victim, are in some way lying or complicit, which I find is just an extraordinary position to be in. And the Prime Minister um, didn't address the substantive part of my um, point, which was on the 26th of July, the Attorney General is going to loosen the restrictions that are already in place around um, counselling notes being given to basically your perpetrator's lawyers um, so that it, there aren't any restrictions. It almost becomes an automatic. The bar will be so low. And the reason why that's having such a dramatic effect is 
the person that raped you is going to know not just about the the trauma that they've put you through, but they're going to know all of your past history as well. That's going to be into the public domain. That's going to be used. Your deepest fears are going to be used against you in a court. Add on to that, you know, apart from the the horror and the the fact that survivors now just don't want to report as it is and it's going to only get worse. Add on to that that the reason, part of the reason that we're getting such low prosecutions is the massive court backlog. So think that now the CPS and prosecutors are going to have to go through even more information. Most of it won't be relevant because that filter that's currently in place will be gone. And and you just think, how are you ever going to get justice for sexual crimes in this country? I don't understand what this new rule change is about. Yeah, and as you say, you know, not just you know the the person you're bringing into the court knowing about your sort of deepest thoughts but also you know your loved ones as well whether that's your children or your mum I'm sure that a lot of people will be you know not necessarily want all these things to be public um you mentioned there about the court backlog uh, which is a really important part of the story uh, we haven't got long left but how concerned are you about the impact of that do you think it could could mean people wait longer for justice um, well, it will mean that people won't get justice. Uh, it, it's already at breaking point and you're looking at, a, you know, an average of two years now. Um, and what that means is people's lives are in limbo. You're literally waiting for that phone call for two years of your life. Okay. And to be quite honest, I can understand why a lot of victims uh, just walk away at that point because they just want to shut the door on it. It's an open wound and they're having to wait two years before they get any sort of retribution for it. And to be quite honest, particularly in rape cases, the prosecution rates are so low. Why would you want to go through that? And I speak to too many survivors that say the court process, which is by nature adversarial, was as bad as the the abuse. So I I just think we're going to lose justice over this. We're out of time. Um, Thank you so much for coming on a really powerful interview there. Thank you. Wow, uh, important interview there, but lots of takes uh, this evening. Uh, we could have our usual post-match roundup uh, with our deputy political editor, uh, Sam Coates, who's uh, here again. Uh, we've been talking a lot about the Lord Guide, and I guess I'm just interested to get your perspective on it. Um, we were saying earlier that we don't know why he resigned, but right now, how secure is Boris Johnson in his premiership, do you think? Well, I mean, that's the question that everybody's asking. I don't think in of itself, Lord Geit's elliptical resignation, he has resigned as he conducted the job, quite frankly, is the trigger that will cause sort of significant action amongst Tory MPs. It's harder for them to take action anyway after Boris Johnson won that vote last week and gave himself a year's prote- protection from a, uh, a another further vote of no confidence. But my gosh, Sophie, things are zigzagging all over the place. Uh, If you just look at that interview that you did with the minister from the Home Office, Tom Purseglove, he said, we have to keep on the table the option of withdrawing from the European Convention of Human Rights. Now, why is that significant? Because at 7.30 this morning, uh, one cabinet minister, and then at 11am, a little bit later this morning, another cabinet minister both said that wasn't on the table. And then at lunchtime, Downing Street said it was, and the entire government position switched around. What does this tell you? It tells you that this is a government zigzagging around. Why is it zigzagging around? Because it's uncertain what it needs to do in order to maintain confidence in the party. And I guess what you've got with the zigzagging is different factions in the party effectively wrestling for control. That's right. And at the moment, the signs since that vote of no confidence last week are that when under pressure, Boris Johnson will lean into the arguments from those on the right of his party. Now, whether he can deliver what they demand is another question. That'll take 15 months to a year for many of those things. But that's his instinct at the moment. I think we did hear from that from Tom Perslove, it did seem, this evening as well. Sam, thanks very much for your uh, roundup. Always uh, interesting uh, to talk to you. Uh, Sam Coates there, another busy <laughs> midweek point uh, in uh, Westminster. I have to say, uh, when we launched this programme on Wednesday nights, we thought that it was always going to be busy uh, on these evenings, and it certainly has proved to be the case. We had a shock resignation this evening. That, of course, is off the back uh, of another busy day uh, in Westminster with, uh, as you said, Sam was saying, uh, wrestling for control going from all sides. We'll be back next week and every week, Wednesdays at 9pm. But next up, you've got Sky News at 10. Thanks for watching. <laughs>